follow the presentation. Um, first of all, uh, a very, very short and brief introduction about Lauf and about our company, what we do. Um, I assume that some of them already know us, but just here the key facts. Um, Laufen is one of the very, very few premium global bathroom brands which are out in this industry. We are producing around 4 million ceramic pieces every year and are active in more than 150 markets, have around 3,000 employees worldwide. Um, yes, we are a Swiss company with, um, let's say, with our main business in Central Europe, but doing export business all over the world and also in South Africa since many, many years. Um, for us, it's very important, um, let's say, to um, uh, on, on in everyday life and also reflect in our product the typical Swiss value, which are like um, efficiency, but also things like, um, uh, let's say, technology, where we, uh, we see ourselves as a leader in this industry. And one of the key things we are trying to achieve in our products is the design. So our uh, key target group is not just a normal house builder. We actually want to work and collaborate with people like you, architects and designers, who put a special focus on designed uh, bathroom design products and not just the everyday need. Um, Laufen is a quite traditional brand founded in 1892, so around 130, 135 years old, and known for his uh, long path of innovation in the industry. So, for example, Laufen was also the brand who introduced the wall hung toilet, which is now an uh, everyday product in uh, most of the market. Um, to the industry. So you see here a picture from the old days where our engineers are sitting around um, this first wall hung toilet, which was developed in our factory. Um, you see still that they are smoking. They are things which would be nowadays no longer allowed, but a funny thing um, to recognize how uh, time and things have changed. Then other key points in our uh, latest development is development of Safi Ceramic, uh, one of our new innovation in sensor materials. I will talk later about this because there are some important facts about sustainability. Then also we entered um, in a later stage, 2016, the business of shower toilets. So to speak about um, sustainability and the challenges um, in our industry, I would like to hand over the word to uh, Christiane Kopp. She is actually our um, expert in this topic and, um, uh, and having the lead in for the whole Laufen group to tackle this topic and can in this kind of way tell more concerning that. Hello, Christiane, and uh, very welcome. Can you hear us? Christiana's microphone has to switch off. So can you switch it on for us, please, Sebastian? I um, um, Perfect, now it works. Now we can, can you hear me? You. Yes, uh, yes you can. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's an honor to be able to talk a little bit about sustainability, kind of my field of, of, of work. With all of you, I'm really impressed by how many attendees there are here today. So um, I hope you find my section of this webinar somewhat useful or, or interesting. So let me share my screen with you. Just one second, please. So. So I thought I would start my presentation by talking a little bit about the challenges that we are facing as an industry in order to become more sustainable. I mean, the entire construction sector is under pressure to reduce its impact on the environment and become more sustainable. And obviously as a sanitary ware manufacturer, we are inserted in this uh, construction industry. And whereas perhaps there are some other 
products or materials that uh, are known to have a very high impact, things like concrete or or steel. Um, the reality is that every industrial process, every manufacturing process has a significant impact on the environment. And so obviously as sanitary wear manufacturers, we have the responsibility as well to analyze all of our processes and see everything that we can improve in, in our industrial process, in, in our products as well. So in that sense, um, we start with the with the raw materials that we use, the supply of the raw materials, and it's not only the extraction per se of the materials, but it's also the transportation of these materials from the extraction side to the factories, the production side that we need to take into consideration. Often these are located in different countries, so there is logistics and Christiana, can I quickly stop you? We can't see your presentation on the side. Ah, can you maybe just share it. Yeah. Maybe Sebastian must unshare and then you share, then we'll be able to see it. Let me see. Is it visible now? Now I can see it. Ah, great. Thanks for letting me know. Perfect. Let's carry on. Right. So, um, the next point then um, is energy consumption and the associated greenhouse gas emissions, uh, of course, are a, a great concern uh, in our sector as well. For the ceramic production in particular, the firing kilns present perhaps the greatest challenge. Um, ceramic pieces need to be fired at over 1200 degrees Celsius for a period of in average, say 12 hours, and a technology that provides the necessary combustion energy and, and to ensure that temperatures are maintained at that high temperature constantly, this technology just doesn't exist yet. So this is something that we are um, having to join forces and, and see how we can tackle um, that, that issue. But Bathroom manufacturers, at least the big players in the industry, rely on a vast number of employees um, in very distinct job roles and across different sites, often also across different countries. So ensuring not only the necessary health and safety conditions, but also equal opportunities for training and for professional development across all of these job roles is, is a complex task as well and needs to be addressed. The logistics infrastructure responsible is responsible for, for large amounts of CO2 emissions again from the transportation of the products back and forth. And also it is responsible for a lot of waste from packaging and, and plastic shrink wrap that is used to wrap big pallets of, of products. Um, currently, the burden of dealing with all of this waste falls largely on the consumers or is perhaps split between our customers and then the end users, but, but that shouldn't be so. Uh, more and more, um, the responsibility is also falling on the side of the manufacturers to reduce their packaging as much as possible or at least make it as easy as possible for the end user to then recycle that packaging that is that is left over. Next, there is the impact that transcends a company's own operations. And, and these are things such as the, the consumption of resources that are needed for a product to function during the use phase of the product. This needs to be carefully considered already at the design phase of a product. So again, ultimately the responsibility is with the manufacturer to make sure that they design products that work as sustainably as possible. And lastly, a great, great challenge is, is for companies to address how they can add value to the communities in which they are inserted and, and, and a, a value that goes beyond the sheer com commercialization of of their products. And this is perhaps the hardest question to ask ourselves in the context of running a business. Is the world better off because our company exists? 
this is a hard question that we need to ask ourselves and, and find find a positive answer to to that question. So considering all of that that I just said, we at Laufen have formulated a sustainability strategy for Laufen, which is to invest in innovations that will enable Laufen to transition to a more circular business model, contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I will speak a bit more about the, the Sustainable Development Goals in a minute, while setting the course for inclusive growth and long-term success for, for our company. Now, I've highlighted here on the screen, perhaps that the key messages that underpinned is this strategy formulation. We are in a process of transition. The, the, the current linear model of so-called take, make, waste model is, is so ingrained in, in this classical manufacturing practices that um, and, 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 and this is so ingrained in our economic model as well that learning how to move away from that transition to a new model that we're not yet familiar with um, and learning how to balance sustainability with affordability and also with business resiliency is a really tricky act and, and we will only really be able to su successfully transition to this model when we engage with our entire value chain. So all of our suppliers, all of the stakeholders that we have a, a, a relationship with. And in doing so, we are convinced we have a much greater chance to future prove not only our own business, but the entire value chain. And essentially this is what we mean when we talk about inclusive growth. So what we've done is we've set up a sustainability committee that is formed by the heads of all of the different departments and divisions of, of our company. So we have the head of, of the production of, of the, the main product categories that, 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 that we manufacture. We also have the head of marketing and product development, supply chain, logistics, information technology, and also human resources. And together we've developed a roadmap for sustainability that is centered around eight main areas of action. And these are decarbonization, materials, products, employees, society, supply chain, logistics, and communications. For each main area of action, we then defined a number of key initiatives. So for example, if we take the main area of decarbonization, we have four key initiatives under decarbonization, and these are energy efficiency, transition to renewable energy, digitalization for decarbonization and emissions compensation. And then again, for each key initiatives, we will have certain projects that then are site specific as well. So, so again, if, if we're talking about energy, it could be that for one side, the priority is to install solar panels to transition to renewable energy. It could be that in another side, the priority is to upgrade the heat recovery system in, in that factory. At the moment, we have under the eight main areas of action, as I said, 19 key initiatives and 40 sustainability projects that are running simultaneously. More and more companies are aligning their sustainability efforts with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, um, often also just referred to as SDGs. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with, with the SDGs already, but for those who aren't, um, I'll try and, and, and sum it up in, in a nutshell. There are 17 sustainable development goals and they originated out of the Paris Agreement of 2015. Um, back then, 193 countries signed the Paris Agreement, which essentially laid out a plan to address climate change. It's also often called uh, the Agenda 2030. The, and the 17 sustainable development goals are at the heart of the Agenda 2030, and, and they serve as, as a guide to all of the nations who signed up to the agreement uh, and to help them curb their emissions and, and reduce pollution in the most socially just way possible. 
Now, for the goals to set out in the Paris Agreement and the SDGs to be met by, by 2030, governments need to involve um, businesses, they need to involve civil society, and they need to involve citizens at an individual level in, in, in all actions. So um, to help us align our own sustainability roadmap to the SDG and to help us maximize our contribution to the sustainable development goals, Laufen has recently joined the United Nations Global Compact as a signatory member. The United Nations Global Compact is a business-led platform that, that also has been set up by the United Nations, essentially to frame corporate actions and, and to also assess corporate actions in the areas of human rights, labor laws, environment, and anti-corruption. So we now have to report on progress in all these areas on a yearly basis. So the graphic that you see here on, on your screen is in, in, in the inner circle, it shows the 17 sustainable development goals. In the next circle, it then shows how the principles of the UN Global Compact relate to the SDGs. And on the outer circle, you see all of our projects from the Laufen uh, Sustainability Roadmap and how they align to the SDGs and, and to the um, United Nations Global Compact. And this serves to, as, as I said, as a, as a reporting tool. It also serves us as a, as a strategic planning tool because we can easily visualize the areas where we should uh, develop more actions going forward as well. Um, one of the um, SDGs, SDG 17, is uh, called Partnerships for Sustainability. Um, the actions, the, the changes that are necessary to, to make essentially all of our way of living more sustainable, they can't be met by any company on its own. Um, it will need a lot of combined efforts, cross-disciplinary teams, uh, partnerships across different sectors to bring these systemic changes about. So in that spirit, I would like to now um, invite um, our guest speaker, Professor Tove Larsen, to talk a little bit about a, a very um, exciting collaboration project that we've had the pleasure to, to be a part of. Professor Tove Larsen is from the Swiss Research Institute for Aquatic Sciences, EAVAG. So at this point, I will stop sharing my screen and um, hand over to Professor Tovalasen. And I think you are on mute still. Yeah, I was muted. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here and I will be even more happy if I can share my screen. Um, you should be able to see it now. Is that true? Yes. Perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm a scientist and I'm going to talk about the value of partnerships for sustainability. And I'm taking you on a journey which may be a little tough, but I hope you will still enjoy it. And of course, the partnership I'm going to talk about is partnership with designers. And I have understood that many of you um are young designers who want to uh progress on uh, in different areas i come from the area of urban water management and this of course has a lot to do with toilets which is what we associate laufen with in between other things and the sdgs of which you have already heard um is quoting some deficits in the area of urban water management. One of them is the sanitation deficit, where 2.6 billion, or approximately a third of the world population, do not have access to safe sanitation. These are toilets. But there's also another deficit. Um, we are Urban water management is coping with the waste, the liquid waste, the water-related waste of communities. And if you look at it, 
although we do have actually a lot of technologies to cope with wastewater, globally 80% of wastewater goes without treatment. Um, you see wastewater and I guess you cannot imagine so much we always think about the things we are seeing. We are thinking about feces, for instance. They are not very nice in surface waters. But actually, if we look at the global situation, the nutrients are the larger problem. Too many nutrients, that's mainly phosphorus and nitrogen, they result in, to, in algae. What you see here, and please note the wording, this is what we call eutrophication. Eutrophication is when we have too many algaes in the water because there are too many nutrients. You also see it here. You may have seen it in your local communities. However, when these algae die, then we get an even worse problem, which is hypoxia, which means that we have no oxygen in the water because all those algae, when they die, they are degraded by bacteria. And we are also calling this dead zones. You see here dead fish, but actually everything in these uh, waters are dead when we are talking about hypoxia. What has this to do with toilets? Um, nutrients, they, from the human metabolism, they are found in urine. Here you see the nitrogen, or the yellow ones, the urine, and you see in wastewater, we have most of the nitrogen and half of the phosphorus in urine, which is only about 1.5 liter per person a day. As compared to the rest of the wastewater, it's not a lot. So that's why we started already in the 90s to work on separating this urine from wastewater so that we could treat the urine and actually return these important nutrients to agriculture instead of letting them out into the water. This is a major problem you see here. You remember eutrophic, too many nutrients, hypoxic when we have no oxygen anymore, and then the green ones are the system in recovery. I have mainly been working for the Northern Hemisphere, and you see we have had a lot of problems. Um, all these red dots are hypoxia. And you also see that there do not seem to be so many in the Southern Hemisphere, but this may actually just be because we are not looking. Um, hypoxic events, they are probably totally underreported in the southern hemisphere. There's another uh, effect which we do not see here, and that is that global growth, population growth, takes place mainly in the areas of, well, in Africa and in Asia. Um, and if you look at the population growth in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, you see that until 2050, we will have a double amount of people. And these are actually the areas where we also do not have a lot of sewers. Um, is this a ma major problem? It actually is. It's a major global problem, not only a local problem. You see here a notion which is called the planetary boundaries, which was introduced in 2009 and which have attracted a lot of attention in the scientific community. And what you see is that there are many areas, for instance, climate change, we all know about that, um, where we are moving towards a critical zone. The, Yellow zones here are areas where we start to be concerned. And you see, strangely enough, in 2009, and it has not changed so much since then, we are not really moving out of the comfort zone for climate change. We still do not, or people, scientists still do not think that climate change will bring the world as we know it outside of its boundaries. It will not destabilize. Um, the soil at the the globe at least not yet on the other hand phosphorus and nitrogen which we have just been talking about 
these scientists and a lot of other scientists think that we are already approaching a very critical area where this large scale eutrophication and hypoxia in the uh, oceans could actually be a major danger for uh, the stability of the world. We also see genetic diversity may have the same effect. And you can imagine, you have already seen it, also the eutrophication hypoxia really has a massive um, influence on genetic diversity. So this is a major critical issue for the world. And unfortunately, people or many people do not really see this. Unfortunately, also, although we do have the technology, the world cannot wait for sewers. We think that, and many other people also think, think so. And actually, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also started to think about that uh, around 2010. And this is a collaboration project which I'm going to show you very briefly here to show how science and designers can work together in order to solve some of the real, real tough problems of sustainability in the world. What you see here is our suggestion for something which was called Reinvent the Toilet Challenge, a large program where we were invited to, um, to participate financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we had a collaboration with EOS. You already saw some of the people of EOS, that's an Austrian design company, uh, which is working heavily with Laufen, and we will come back to them later. We suggested something which will um, connect to this advanced container-based sanitation business, we interpreted this in the way we would make a fleet of toilets and uh, we would, these would in essence be dry toilets where we would separate urine and feces. We would then transport urine and feces to a nearby uh, resource recovery plant. This is an example of the circular economy instead of um, of polluting the surface water, we would recover nutrients as fertilizer, energy from feces, and also some water from urine. We would also recirculate or reuse water. I'll come back to the role of water in these essential dry toilets. Um, but we would do that on site. So what you will see next has to do only with the water. The purpose is that we would provide safe sanitation. You remember the sanitation deficit, a comfortable toilet with available water, and effective protection of water resources at extremely low cost. So you remember we wanted to protect the water resources against nutrients. We started this project in 2011. This is Hal Gründel, uh, our collaborator at EOS and a young designer. And we started actually to ask people what they uh, want. It does not make, make any sense to provide people with things that they may have to pay a little bit for and that they don't uh, want to know, uh, want to use. That's where we need the designers. We learned that people essentially wanted water. They wanted to be able to um, wash their hands when they had been to the toilet. So we, oh, well, the designer invented how we could do this. They also wanted to be able to, to do anal cleansing. Here you see the toilet and you can imagine when you use the toilet first, you have to push this lid, then the you defecate in the back and urine pass down here. Then when you want to do uh, anal cleansing, you start this water and then automatically the lid will close and you will have some device down here, we'll come back to that, which will divert water away from the urine tank. 
people also wanted to be able to flush the toilet and we could do that but unfortunately only in the front part of the toilet but still this would be very important you just imagine the women they would not want to leave a toilet with blood traces in it and the same principle of diverting water away from urine and of course closing the lid we wanted dry feces well, the water treatments, that's of course what we were uh, providing. We invented a gravity driven membrane reactor, integrated it into a membrane bioreactor. You're not really supposed to know all these terms. I'll shortly explain what it is. And then we polished by activated carbon in the clean. Well, here we had the uh, gravity driven membrane reactor up. Up here we had the clean water tank where we did some polishing and added some residual chlorine. It looks like this. It's just a simple membrane. Oh, it's not so simple, but that is what we normally use for uh, producing drinking water. This membrane um, only functions by gravity. Normally we would use high pressure, but that's too complicated in an on-site installation. On this uh, membrane, we will have bacterial growth. You can compare this to the bacterial growth you have on your teeth. You have to brush your teeth every day. We would normally also have to clean this membrane every day or every other day. But because we are only using gravity for pressing the water through, then we have some higher organisms that can live there, the small worms, and they will eat this biofilm, so they will brush this, uh, bio, uh, this uh, membrane every day. And then finally, we just have some activated carbon to polish the water that's not colored, etc., and put in some chlorine, that hygiene is effective. I will not say that this was easy, but we could do it as scientists. But what we could not do, the main problem which we experienced here was actually a design problem. You remember we needed to separate urine and water. Here you have a very simple urine water separation. In the default situation, we have urine going down into the uh, urine tank. Uh, and then you see here there's uh, a way to push this up. So immediately when we use water, water will be diverted. It's simple, but not simple enough because mud will enter the toilet uh, because this is a squatting toilet. But actually the real problem is information. The urine water separator must simply know when it's exposed to urine and when it is exposed to water. We solved this with electronics and it worked fine in the lab, but we were really doubtful whether it would also work in the slum. So we got stuck with a design problem. Then after some time, our designer, Hal Gründel, he solved the problem because he realized that you could use something which is called the teapot effect. You may know it as a red wine effect. When you are pouring a glass of red wine and you have a white tablecloth, if you're not pouring strongly enough, then the, um, uh, the red wine will flow around, like you see urine is here flowing around the corner. Uh, um, and here if we want the urine to go down there in with the red wine, you would not want it. And then we come afterwards with the water and we push it so strongly that it will not do this trick so that we can flush the toilet. So this toilet just intrinsically know when there will be urine and when there will be water. So this is my story and Christiane will show how Laufen has transformed this into a product. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Is my microphone active? Yes, all good. Yes. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, so if I go back to my screen now, I'll show you how um, we then joined this partnership 
because essentially at this point it was um, the the group of scientists with um, a solution that only went to a certain point. A designer came in and and created the solution to bypass that problem, and that worked really well. But then um, they they still needed someone to integrate this into a product that could be commercialized, that could be manufactured at large, large scale, so that we could introduce it in in the market. So this is what we did with the safe toilet. Um, so we joined, as I said, as, a, as an industry partner in, in this uh, project and worked closely with EOS to integrate that um, urine trap um, into, a, um, into a toilet pan. And what you see here, hopefully the video will work, um, is, um, I'll try and pause just at the right second to show the effect that Tove was describing. So there you go. So essentially we have a little channel just below the bowl and um, the yellow arrows represent the, the flow of urine that comes at a slower speed and obviously at a lower volume. So they just essentially stick to the surface and passively divert into the urine channel, so you don't need any sensors, any mechanical components whatsoever. When the flushing water then comes, because it is just charged at a higher volume and, and um, a higher speed as well, it rinses the bowl, goes directly into the main siphon, and only a little bit of the flushing water at the end also gets diverted into the 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 little urine siphon that separates the urine and that is by design so that you don't have any any odors that could come back from the separated um, urine pan. So essentially this is a, a very elegant solution then that can replace any standard WC because for the user of the toilet for all intents and purposes this is just a normal toilet and it doesn't need any extra maintenance or anything different in that sense. So what we have is um, a toilet that effectively separates the different waste streams. Um, it requires no change in no user change, user behavior, sorry, user behavior change whatsoever. Um, we've developed it in here in, 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 in Europe primarily, so it complies with all the European norms, both for WCs and for urinals. Um, as I said before, the, the waste stream separation occurs entirely passive without any electronics or sensors or any mechanical components. The toilet is rimless, it's wall mounted, and um, it's deliberately designed to look like a conventional uh, a toilet pan. Um, it adheres to the highest standards of hygiene and comfort, and essentially it, it made the, the, the waste stream separation as easily as possible. So this is the user interface, perhaps the beginning of this process that Professor Tovelasen was explaining, ensuring that the waste streams are separated properly, uh, properly so that the, the treatment of the different waste streams can then happen more efficiently as well because there isn't any cross-contamination. The second product that we're now working on at, still in, in the context of this collaboration, is a squatting pan that also uses the same separation technology. So it will also have a diverting channel inside the squatting pan. So in this picture here, you see um, on the left, again, um, Dr. Harald Gründel holding a, a prototype of, of the squatting pan and showing it to the delegates of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that came to the Laufen factory two years ago to, to see this, the development of this product. And on the picture on the right, we have a lot of um, Christofferich also from the from Studio EOS installing a pilot product in in for field test in, in Namibia. So this is the, the current state of this project. And as part of our agreement with this collaboration project and with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is that we will bring the development of the squatting pan to the point where it is ready to begin 
industrial manufacturing. And then we will hand over all of the plans and all of the information to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation so that they can find local manufacturers um, around the world to produce these toilets. Because part of the one one of the parameters of, of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for this project is that this needs to be a solution that is um, as accessible as possible. And our manufacturing sites are in Europe, so we don't have the, the capacity uh, physically to produce these product these products in in the in the volume that is needed and at the price point that is needed for it, for it to be truly accessible so what we're doing we're, we're taking the costs of the development of the product and once this is ready we just then hand it over to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and and they can decide whether they do it open source or, or whether they partner with local manufacturing processes so this is just an example of how different bodies and companies can come together to to bring to the market really innovative solutions that tackle really serious problems. Um, and this was it from my side. I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back over to my colleague Sebastian. Yes, many thanks uh, also from my side to uh, Christiane and Tove uh, who were I think for everybody of us uh, showcasing um, a very uh, unique case how we can practically uh, implement sustainability in our company and in our product and um, catching up the question with Chris, Christiane came up with uh, which actually really got into my head as a key question I mean um, the sense of existing of a company is not just making profit and let's say growing, the sense of a company should be also to make the world a little bit better. And, and because of that, the question, is the world or can the world get better with us as a company, um, is a very central question from my point of view. And for sure, by um, providing product solution like the safe toilet, it's a very central point from us. Um, I want to shortly come back to this, um, just to also, show you let's say the product also from a from a more practical commercial side so here we go again this is um the drawing of the product um how does it look like and again um you can see this effect which sorry which was called red wine uh, effect which you can see here the urine is following this separation edge and then um, moving smoothly into the urine trap beside the flush water and the heavy dirt is directly um, going out with the normal siphon. So um, this solution actually is not only planned to be used in let's say very rural areas or slum areas, it can be also used in commercial buildings, in residential building apartment and villas. Especially, um, it is it is useful in towers and villas because here is an example of um, of a, let's say um, a, a special sustainability housing project which was done in Switzerland. So here, the safe toilet is used in the bathrooms, and then you have a you have two split channels um, to to separate um, the urine and um, the grey water, and um, then in the downside in the cellar you have a urine preparation let's say machine to separate the uh, to to let's say to get reuse of the urine as a fertilizer and so on and then you can use the gray water because the gray water is no longer polluted with urine so this is a very practical example how this technology can be used also in residential projects or in commercial projects like offices and so on um, the great thing is about um, our company, our brand, that it's not only this one single product which is highly sustainable and has this sustainable approach um, from, let's say, a more product-related side. Uh, we also have quite a lot of products which address this topic, sustainability and um, One very important point uh, if we talk about sustainability, is water safety. So how we can save waters. Um, in the past, the flush 
uh, water which was used was normally always six liters in the very past, even 13 liters to flush a toilet. Nowadays, six and three liter is a standard, but we can even go down to four and a half and three liters. And we meanwhile have even certain toilets which can flush four and two liters, which is really the super uh, minimum what you can reach out for. So here, um, based on an assumption that um, in average, a person is using five times per day a toilet. Um, this means six liters multiplied with five would be around 30 liters. And if you say you go then down to two or three liters, you can you can save around 15 liters per day, which is quite a lot if you count it on for the full population. And then the same also for urinals. We have more or less all our urinals are made for one liter flush solutions. And we even have um, totally waterless urinals in our assortment. So um, speaking about toilets and the flushing effect of toilets, it's important to understand that um, there is not only the aspect of water saving, there's also the aspect of how many chemicals you need in order to clean the toilet. And there, um, there is a new technology in the game now, also since some few years, which is called Rimless. And here we see some rimless toilets from competitors. I have also shown this in my last webinar. Um, and many of our, uh, let's say, products you find on the markets are using this kind of L-shaped rim and calling this rimless. So what we are trying to do, we are really trying to reach a proper clean rim without any gap or L-shape here on the top. So how we can achieve this, that, that we can have such a good um, let's say good flushing result and and also in the same time such a proper clean rim because with such a rim you need much less chemicals to clean the bowl and also in the same way you save a lot of time so we are doing it like this i mean here in the front you have to flush you have a larger hole here a smaller hole here and another hole here and in this way this flush stream here goes stronger and uh, longer than this one which goes under the other and in this way, you have this kind of tornado stream and not and the water is not splashing over. Because if they would, if the hole is here and here would be the same, the water would crush into it here in the front and everything would split over. So it's it sounds quite simple, but um actually this technology took a lot of time for our technicians to develop and also uh, several months and even years for, for laboratory. So this is about flushing. Then if we talk about toilets, uh, sorry, about urinals, you see here, this is the principle how a waterless urinal works like. And maybe before coming to that, also in urinals, we have the trend going from rim urinals, like here, to rimless solutions, where you again have the advantage of less clean. And then another thing is our urinals always flush the full bowl, like you can see here, and not just a 25 degree angle, which is actually um, the, from an EN certificate standard, um, the, the minimum angle you have to have. And many urinals often only cover this minimum angle, like you can see here. So there's a big unflushed area, which then uh, leads to the fact that you need to clean this with chemical, and again, you, you pollute the environment. About um, waterless urinals, we are working with a so-called Erlen Meyer flask in order to ensure that the um, that the smell of the urine is not coming out of the urine and pollutes the room. So here you have a citrus, let's say like a perfume, which is preventing that the bad smell can go out again. Because here the urine comes in, then it goes into this trap, and the smell would take this route outside. But here this is blocked with a uh, with, with this special perfume blocker in order that the smell is not going outside the, this Erlen Meyer flask. Um, some more words about urinals. Our urinals always have the system 100% concealed in the ceramic and not in the wall like here. So here is the kind of urinals you can have and we are mainly active in this field with integrated control. Because we believe it should be made as easy as possible for the installer at the very end and also for maintenance. Because if everything is in the ceramic piece, you can easily maintain it from below and you don't have to get very difficult access 
let's say through a radar box or even a take or something. Um, then talking about more aspects in the bathroom about water safety. I mean, one aspect is also the shower. Here you can have water safety um, or water savings in the C4, but the C4 you can only, let's say, uh, create in a water and efficient way if also the tap, the, the shower tap is adapted to a water saving standard. And for bathtubs, it's all about the inner size of the bowl. So for that reason, for example, we developed a bathtub which has, as you can see here, this is the Life and Pro bathtub, um, the siphon already included here in the bottom. And in this way, you don't need to um, make a hole in the floor when installing it. And also the whole, uh, let's say, body which you have to fill up is not that big. So it's another water saving um, possibility. And, um, and, uh, and the other topic is also the durability of the product. And here, if you are talking about ceramic material, you can say ceramic in general is already quite environment friendly because it's 100% recyclable. So even if pieces which are taken out by the sorting department at the very end of the production because they are deformated or, or um, they didn't pass, the high pressure test, um, the, the air pressure test, so every toilet what we are selling is air pressure tested and the one which don't pass this test, they would be not sold, so they would be then recycled. So in a ceramic production, you have a 100% recycle rate, which is extremely high. I mean, there are very few products who have such a high rate of recycling. And, uh, and then also, the, uh, I mean, the raw material is 100% uh, natural, uh, so it's actually kaolin, clay, feldspar, and quartz sand. So you can talk about, if you talk about ceramic products, you really talk about 100% natural and 100% recycled products, which is extremely important if we talk about sustainability in production. Uh, yes, about the other facts, um, I don't want to go into details because we don't have enough time, but the other thing is durability of the product. So a long life cycle, I mean, is key also to ensure um, uh, a sustainable product because a, a product wouldn't be sustainable if you have to throw it away after two, three years. Because of that, as, as, as may be also aware for many of you, every part which can come in touch with water, like the rim, the C4, or the overflow waste, is always glazed, even inside. So this makes the product very, very durable. Then um, if we look at our latest product, which we developed um, like Sapphire Ceramic with this very thin and slim uh, rims and surfaces, um, this is some a material which is having exactly the same attributes as the normal ceramic materials, but we can save a lot of material because this material is so strong that we can work with one wall sides and not two wall sides like we have it in the traditional ceramic. Why is it like this? I mean, if we check the, the attributes of Sapphire Ceramic, you see impact resistance against impact is the same as in vitreous china. This is the normal ceramics, but it's double that if it comes to bending stretch. So if you want to bend it like this. And um, because of that, we can work with one wall. And also, besides having the, the, the very important sustainability effect, um, we ha can also follow the current design trend, which goes like in the iPhones for very slim phones compared to these kind of old Nokia handles. Uh, and then at the very end, you can even go very extreme in um, sustainability and water saving in our products. Like, for example, we have developed special vacuum toilets. Um, I mean, we only developed the ceramic part, the, the vacuum part with the sucking system. Uh, here you uh, can join up with a with an external partner, but with these vacuum toilets, which are often used in cruise ships, also, um, you can have a flush with only which is only consuming 0 0.5 liters. So this is also a thing which is coming up more and more in large scale projects where you have a centralized vacuum system in order to reduce water, and this for sure. Um, knowing the, the situation of South Africa and also the, the events which have happened um, some years back with the 
with the water shortage a highly interesting um, product. And the nice thing about, uh, uh, let's say, our brand, our product is everything is documented. So this means if you are doing a, pro a project with our product, if you are executing anything and you need to prove, let's say, the sustainability um, the durability of our product, the water saving. You can easily find this on our website. You just go to the website. Moment, and here to our website. You go to services, and then you go to certificates. And you can find all this. This is just a, few, a short selection of our certificates, which are online, like the REED certificate, which is um, clearing that no harmful chemicals are used in our production processes and in our materials or the environmental product declaration, um, ISO certificate, and also declaration of performance, which is about water usage. So you can find all these kinds of things uh, easily accessible on our website. So with this, um, I would like to close, um, let's say, my presentation. And I would like to invite you also then, after this uh, webinar, to try the red wine effect directly by yourself. I will show how you should pull it and how you should not pull it that the wine is not properly dropping into the glass. In this way, have a nice evening and cheers. And if there are any questions, we are open to answer them. Many thanks. Sebastian, Sebastian. thank you very much. Thank you very much to Prof. Larsen and Christiana also. I think one thing that is very clear is uh, Slaufen is definitely a world leader if it comes to sustainability in, uh, in ceramic products. And that is one of the big reasons why Itopa partnered with Slaufen as a, as a product distributor in, in South Africa. Uh, Sebastian, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for a very, very interesting uh, webinar. I just want to repeat, if there's any questions, you can drop emails to um, to uh, Nicole. Yeah. Nicole will direct it to the right people in Italtal to handle. Again, thanks very much. Thank very interesting webinar. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and thanks uh, everybody for joining. And um, I hope then to see some of you again when we are able to travel again and also come to South Africa uh, and to see everybody in person. Many thanks. Thank you also from my side. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Nicole, if you are still on, yeah, I see you still on. Just stay on until the end, please.